The BRICS Summit Gala Dinner felt like a benefit performance for a washed-up actor trying to make a comeback on the big stage after setting the neighboring theater on fire. President of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin. Putin hasn't addressed this many foreign guests since launching his full-scale aggression against Ukraine. Thank you all for being here today, and I propose a toast to the prosperity of our nations, to the strengthening of our cooperation, and to the health of everyone present. It's only at the post-summit press conference that Putin's peacemaker mask finally falls off. While answering a journalist's question, he basically admits that North Korean soldiers are now involved in the aggressive war he started against Ukraine. Let me start by answering the first part of your question. Images are a serious thing. If there are images, then they reflect something. Regarding our relations with the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, as you know, our strategic partnership treaty was ratified today. There is Article 4 in it. We never doubted the the leadership of North Korea treats our agreements seriously, but what we will do and how will we do it is up to us. We are in touch with our North Korean friends and we will see how this process develops. The independent Russian outlet Medusa obtained a Kremlin manual, instructions from the Russian presidential administration for the media on how to cover the Kazan summit. Among the mandatory talking points for Russian propaganda, Vladimir Putin is the informal leader of the global majority. Western elites are in panic, and the West is gripped by anxiety. For two days, journalists, political analysts, and economists have been watching the political salad gathered at the same table in Kazan with great interest. There's Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Turkey recently applied to join BRICS, but India blocked it due to Turkey's cozy relationship with neighboring Pakistan. India's not-so-friendly neighbor. And there's the Iranian president. Iran has already joined BRICS, prompting Saudi Arabia to bow out of participation. Here we have the head of the Palestinian Authority and Fatah leader, Mahmoud Abbas, calling for the urgent admission of the Palestinian National Authority and Gaza Strip into BRICS. We renew in this respect the desire of the state of Palestine to join the BRICS group, and by strengthening the partnership, dialogue and engagement in activities with its members, affirming our full readiness to commit to its purposes and the practices and activities of this group in order to achieve its goals and achieve a strategic partnership to build a better future for humanity. Joining the Palestinian request was Belarus's dictator, Alexander Lukashenko. He's eager to make Belarus a member of the bloc. The BRICS member states have the power to ensure that real levers of influence shift into the hands of the progressive global majority. We fully embrace the philosophy of BRICS, and Belarus comes to you with concrete ideas and projects aimed at addressing universal challenges. We are ready to become an active participant in this alliance. But if you really listen to Putin and his guests, it starts to feel like they're interpreting BRICS as a kind of dream casino, the way the robot Bender from Futurama imagined happiness, with blackjack, courtesans, and so on. Because apparently, violating international law does lead to sanctions, and they hurt a lot. Behind the facade of an imposed rules-based world order lie attempts to restrain growing competitors and the independent, uncontrolled development of countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Illegal unilateral sanctions, blatant protectionism, manipulation of currency and stock markets, and interference in domestic affairs under the guise of promoting democracy, human rights, and even climate change, it's all being used. These frankly unhealthy methods and approaches not only lead to new conflicts, but also exacerbate old tensions. One example of this is Ukraine, which has been and continues to be used to create critical security threats for Russia. 
While our vital interests and legitimate concerns about the violation of the rights of Russian-speaking people are being completely ignored, each rocket that hits residential buildings in Gaza, the new casualties and injuries in Beirut or southern Lebanon, these rockets are tearing apart the United Nations system. Where is the International Criminal Court? Or is it only used to pursue countries in the global south, where international justice is needed merely to issue documents and communiques? What about life? What about caring for the lives of women and children in the global south? Let's seek practical plans, bold plans, to reform the United Nations system, which quite frankly is capitulating to the rise of fascist regimes amid a historically painful backdrop. The better new world would be one where there are no traces of the sanctions imposed on us, where acts of aggression, wars, conquests and genocide are non-existent. Over the past year, many events have unfolded globally, many of which have impacted peace and security, particularly in the West Asian region. Many of our positions have been weakened. Moreover, the unwavering support from Western countries, led by the United States, along with the Zionist regime of Israel, is doing everything possible to survive and strengthen their foothold in the region. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres came to meet with Vladimir Putin, wanted by the International Criminal Court, to urge the Russian dictator to make peace while listening to a humiliating lecture on the anniversary of the UN's founding. At the same time, we believe it is essential for the further effective functioning of the UN to adapt its structure to the realities of the 21st century. This includes expanding the representation of countries from Asia, Africa and Latin America in the Security Council and other key bodies of the UN, including those whose leaders are present in this hall. The Pact for the Future includes important steps on disarmament, including the first multilateral agreement on nuclear disarmament in more than a decade, and steps that address the weaponization of outer space and the use of lethal autonomous weapons. Across the board, we need peace. We need peace in Gaza with an immediate ceasefire, the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages, the effective delivery of humanitarian aid without obstacles, and we need to make irreversible progress to end the occupation and establish the two-state solution as it was recently reaffirmed once again at, by a UN General Assembly resolution. We need peace in Lebanon with an immediate cessation of hostilities moving to the full implementation of UN Security Council Resolution 1701. We need peace in Ukraine, a just peace in line with UN Charter, international law and General Assembly resolutions. We need peace in Sudan, with all parties silencing their guns and committing to a path towards sustainable peace. Those were the messages I have delivered to the high-level segment of the General Assembly in September in New York. And finally, we have commentary on the Kazan summit from the man who gave the world the idea of BRICS a quarter century ago and even coined the name. Former Goldman Sachs economist Jim O'Neill believes BRICS will never become a global economic organization, replace the dollar, or serve as an alternative to the G7 as long as China and India refuse to cooperate on trade. Because I will have Mr. BRICS stamps on my forehead forever, I get asked by many of their advisors, and of course I've met some of the leaders, but uh, and I say to them, why, why don't you try to uh, make it clear what things you can genuinely achieve together? And there's, there are some. They could, they could do wonders uh, about funding new vaccines or drugs for infectious diseases, which are a huge problem in many of the BRICS countries. They could do enormous things if they were serious about fighting climate change. And of course, linked to this rather slightly fanciful talk about some alternative currency to the dollar, if they wanted to be really serious about economic matters, why don't they genuinely pursue less tariff-based trade between each other? You know, I often say that I'll treat the BRICS group seriously when I see signs that the two countries that really matter, 
China and India actually really trying to agree on things rather than effectively trying to confront each other all the time. The day that China and India really managed to get over their long historic battles and decided to really cooperate on some big issues that would benefit each of them, especially bilateral trade, but also uh, climate change and global economic matters. The day that I saw China and India being serious about that, then I would have a different view, because then there would be the basis for them forcing their way into more uh, deserved responsibility in global organizations, and it would be the basis for uh, a serious thought about challenging the dominance of the dollar. But it doesn't look to me as though that day is around the, around the corner.